All roads lead to power. And on this show, we're going to break that idea down a little bit. What is power? Who has it? And how do you get it? I'm your host, Jeff Coulard. Welcome to the show. It's a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Because the so-called real world of men and money and power comes merrily along on the fuel of fear and anger and frustration and craving and the worship of self. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline. If people don't learn power, people don't wake up. And if they don't wake up, they get left out. Okay, welcome back to another episode of Powerful. My name is Jeff Coulard, and I'm really excited about today's guest. He is a coach, a facilitator, a speaker, a father, an all-around great guy. He's uh, he's going to lead us through a conversation, or I'm going to maybe tease out from him a conversation around focus and performance and navigating uncertainty and leadership, and I'm sure emotional intelligence. We're going to cover tons of territory. Um, we always have very interesting conversations. So uh, without further ado, my good friend, Evan Westlake, welcome to the show. Good evening, Jeff. Pleasure to be here. I've seen a few of your episodes. It's uh, Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, thanks for carving out time. I know it's a busy time of year, it being close to Christmas, and um, you're a busy guy. You've got a family. You've got a, a busy coaching practice. It's uh, Monday night at 8.30. I know it, it means a lot for you to carve out some time to chat. So so thank you sure. for, uh, for joining me. Um, why don't we start with, I'm curious about how you found yourself to be a coach. Like, what was the path and like high level? Um, but if there's some interesting twists and turns, like, because I know that you, your background is in sports, like sport mm-hmm. performance, I believe. And you've, um, you've done some adventure races. You, you were actually a race director for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if that was simultaneous to you becoming a coach or whether that was a, a lifetime before this. And then there's a pivot point in <laughs> time, but I'm how did you get to it? I was recently telling a client of mine, so I did this for 10 years and this for 10 years and this for 10 years and this for 10 years. Well, you're not 60. No, there's lots of overlap and, and, the, and the dots, you know, they, they connect in a weird way. Um, sh- short version, overlap, uh, you know, high level, how did I get to be a coach? I, I've always been in some version of professional development or helping people learn and get better. I mean, the first job I ever had was, was teaching teaching sailing 15 years old. Um, uh, that sounds very privileged as I say it. I think the first time I act, job I actually had was pumping gas, but anyway. Um, and, and and along the way, I ended up just really fascinated with with coaching and helping individuals get better. And, and, and then my first step into true one-on-one coaching as we know it, executive coaching, uh, would have been coming out of grad school grad school in sports psychology, performance psychology, and working one-on-one with really high-end ultra-endurance athletes, uh, runners and expedition racers and and cyclists, people who ride for three or four days at a time. And that was the first step into coaching. But it's hard to make a real hard living at that, a real real good living at that. And so there was a lot of overlap with speaking and my own racing. Um, and then when family came around, I just, I needed something more stable. Um, so, so took a left turn into training and development, kind of a branch of HR and and the way to put the two together as life progresses is executive coaching. And that's what happened about five years ago. Executive coaching happened when I got my three sentence handshake, (laughs) left the downtown gig like so many other. Yeah. Um, what's the, I guess, what are the, the parallels or what's the, the common thread that ties together the sport performance mm. and executive coaching? Cause I know, I'll, and we're going to probably dig into this in a bit more detail around kind of focus and performance and like mm. some of the pieces that I know are really, you know, strengths of yours or areas of practice that you really focus in on. Um, is there a common thread? Is there something, is, do you find yourself, are the conversations or the tools that you're, you're used to use with high performance athletes, are they similar, different to what you're doing um, coaching leaders and executives these days? Um, y- yes, uh, certainly. I mean, even in the last, uh, since, since COVID hit the fan nine months ago in the last 
uh, nine months, six months, three months, three weeks. There have been a lot of conversations about confidence, a lot of conversations about distraction, a lot of conversations about um, fundamental best practices. And, and as much as we want to say sports psychology, that's the thing that's going to make you win or help you get ahead. The fact is that 98% of your performance is still how you treat your body and how you work your body. And, and what goes on up here is that last 2% that could push you over the edge. It's hard to be at the top of your game without it, but it isn't the whole picture. It's the it's the top end of, of fine tuning. So those are some of the big ones that are overlapping in, in the last nine months, confidence, focus, distraction. Um, and frankly, even just the where people find the energy inside themselves to push, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's dig into one of those or all of them. We'll probably cover all of them. We got an hour, which is why I like this show because we can really dig into um, we can go places um, in the conversation. So let's talk about focus and distraction because those are kind of, those are the same, same two sides of the same coin probably. Mm -hmm. And like, I know in myself, it's a constant battle, you know, to be waged and to be won on a moment to moment day to day basis of how do I stay focused on the things that are most important and how do I keep distraction at bay? Um, but let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about kind of your perspective on it and maybe your own journey with focus and distraction in your own practice. If we can kind of tie together, like, how are you doing with, with focus on, on the things that are important to you? And... How's everyone doing? Lately? <laughs> like, how am I doing these days? Yeah. How are you doing? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of cool you asked the question that way with that lead up because I have been, uh, especially in the last, uh, I'd say three to six weeks, I have been on a, on a, on a mission, on a, on a mantra that is uh, starve your distractions. And, and I have been looking high and low and left and right. And even just even, you know, behind this camera that no one can see is, is as few distractions as possible. Um, it, it was a way that I lived decades ago, this really clean, simple, the only things in your life are the burning yes. Um, and, and it's, it's helped a lot. <laughs> let's face it, we're all going through a lot of, uh, a lot of distractions and a lot of things that pick away at our energy. I'm doing, I'm doing better now. I'm doing better now than I was, I'd say three months ago. And, and in part, I think that's, um, starving distractions left, right, and center. How do you, how do you do that more practically speaking? So there's obviously like, you know, the, the burning. Yes. We can talk about that. How do you decide what's a burning? Yes. And what's uh what's not. Um, but when you say starving distractions, what does that practice look like for you? Yeah. Um, it looks like, um, I, I'm, I'm, you and I have had this conversation, conversations about things similar before. So, so you're familiar with like the concept of the observer, right? This, this, this part of your brain that kind of slices off and watches you do things and goes, wait a minute, Westlake, what is that? <laughs> um, and, and it really, I mean, to start your distractions requires using your observer quite, quite heavily, quite thoroughly and watching myself. So, so practically it means, um, moment to moment catching when I'm coming down the stairs and I'm going into the kitchen for tea because I've got another coach call in 20 minutes and, and my wife starts talking to me about anything, like literally anything. And, and, I, and I catch my brain going off to give energy to this conversation and realize I love you. I want to support that. And it is going to take me away from prep for that client that I have in 20 minutes. And that's a distraction, which doesn't mean it's not valuable, mm -hmm. but it's not the path I'm on right now or that I have chosen to be on this morning. Um, it, it, it's a lot of catching. It's a lot of catching yourself go sideways. As you said earlier, moment to moment. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember talking to, to different athletes about how you can either make uh, what what I eventually called landscape decisions. You can choose to have an office that is stark. You know, your desk is white. There's nothing on it except the one 
document you're working on. The desktop of your computer is perfectly clean except that one file you work on, stark landscape, nothing else is in the way. Or you can do the little, 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 hundreds of little decisions all day. And, and either one works, they're just very different approaches. So are you, you've moved more to stark landscape from the sounds of it. I like stark landscape. Yeah, where I can get it, where I can do it. <laughs> before we play, we, before you press start, we were talking about how I, I go to the cabin. Um, my family has a small cabin out in just the edge of BC, three hours west of here. And, and it's simple. And, and simple is not easy to accomplish, I admit. You got to kind of hold the value for simple all day, every day. But you end up with things that don't distract you. You end up with a place where there's one couch for six people. And there's one coffee table for six people. And there's one deck for six people. And it's there's nothing to pull you sideways. And even having those spaces to go to become like a little island of strength for your for your focus. You can appreciate just how undistracted you could be, you know? How do you make the decision on what to focus on? So you mentioned, you know, that in the morning you've decided that focusing on your client's needs and that's how you're going to, you're going to catch everything that isn't that, whether it's a conversation with your wife mm -hmm. or a social media, something, or who knows what is like begging for your attention. Um, how do you, how do you set those priorities? Or how do you, how do you, do you have a practice around setting out intentions for what yeah. you want to focus on moment to moment or day to day? Um, I, I do. Yeah. Um, I have a couple. I, uh, I, I, I believe strongly based on both experience and study that, that the start of anything sets the tone. The start of the day sets the tone for the day. The start of the Podcast sets the tone for the, it's why people have intros. It's why as a speaker, you give someone an intro, right? Set the tone, um, start of a meeting. So for about a decade, I've had the same start to my day, 350 odd days a year, same 30 minutes, can do it anywhere, whether I get up at 5.30 or 9.30, uh, both are extreme. And it's, it's, it's move. For about eight to ten minutes and that could be as simple as walk the dog around the block but like move almost immediately and then it's read nothing electronic and nothing work archie counts clive Cuffler pulp fiction counts but it's just it, it's not work and and it's not electronic and then it's blank sheet making notes what matters today uh, I finish off this for that for finish off this for, for send that and start that and uh, spend time with bachelor number two inside out. I uh, Covey was Covey the first guy who really made that popular that idea inside out. Um, yeah, and and, it's, and so the notes kind of bring that focus out of you of me. Um, I fell away from that <laughs> uh, for about the first three, four weeks of April and, and days, like it would take hours to get refocused on a given day if I didn't start the day well. So I'm, uh, I'm very meticulous and very careful about how any given task starts, any given project or window of time starts. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. No, it sounds like it's a it's a high level of intentionality around setting setting yourself up for like it's a bit of a morning routine. And the like the move, read, write, or journal. Is there a um and you say that's like kind of a half an hour thing. Is that pretty prescriptive or is it like you just kind of go with it? And if you move for 15 minutes and you read for five, like, is it pretty fluid or is it something that has a bit of rigidity to it? I'm always interested in like structure. Yeah. Versus fluidity in my I'm a big fan of framework without prescription. So uh, is it rigid? No. But do all three of those happen? Yes. Um, an exercise I, I did with a client a couple weeks ago about um uh, about about empowerment for their team 
but they want to keep their team focused. And, and the exercise was called Boundaries and Freedoms. And so we, we spent a bunch of time s digging out from the leadership and managers, what are the boundaries, the places that your staff can't cross? Um, and, and what's the goal or the intention that, that you're after in, in the new year with your customers? And so just like a soccer team, just like a soccer field, here's what you can't do. Here's where you're going and all the freedom is in the middle. As long as you're playing in the middle, run like hell. That's the structure. Um, you have the freedom inside that. So, so framework, yes. Prescriptive, rigid, no. No. I like that. Um, I tend to resist um, like too much rigidity, even if I'm the one trying to impose it on myself. It's a funny, um, funny thing. So I like that frameworks, frameworks, yes, and rigidity. You know, give you enough structure to be successful, but not so much that it gets stifling or gets like yeah. binding. Yeah. And so out of the blue, my 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 youngest uh, Saul says to me the other day, "So Dad, like." he came down and i was just i was just finishing up my read and about to and about to start writing and he asked me so what do you, what do you write like what are you writing about i'm um, just writing about what i want to what i want to do today oh okay and he watches me make a few notes so what i want to do today is and he proceeds to lay out this this activity based plot you know, for his day, I'm gonna I'm gonna do school for like this, and I'm gonna do it till I get that done, and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna do a little bit of this, and then I'm gonna have lunch, and then after lunch I'm gonna draw until my second class, and then after my second class, then that's free time. And I'm going well, you know, here's here's your chunks, here's your framework. Um, cool, man. That sounds like a that sounds like a really good day, and, and you know, coach brain kicks in. Which part are you looking forward to, and what what do you think is gonna make it hard? Um, but, uh, it was really neat to hear him lay it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To establish a bit of structure and framework in his own life. Um, so you're, you're a coach, you do a fair bit of coaching. I also know right. that you, have, yeah. you do a lot of speaking. Um, we actually met at TEDx Canmore, I think mm -hmm. was the first time our paths crossed four or five years ago, 2016, maybe. Um, you also do a lot of training and facilitation. Which of those is your sweet spot? If you had to pick, like I can only coach moving forward, I can only speak, or I can only do kind of workshops, training, and development. Which one of those really lights you up? If you'd asked me that question six years ago, I would have said group facilitation, particularly what I would call small group. And to me, small is 18 to 38. Um, probably because that's my history. That's where I started. 25 years ago is is half day workshop small size off sites um lately even though workshops are still about half of my time i coaching is just juicy you know and and maybe it's because i've done 12 360 debriefs in the last 3 weeks um and 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 they go deep you know people by the time they get to reading a 360 and then debriefing it with me as a coach we've got some rapport built and we're we're going into the deep end of the pool and and i love that that's really fulfilling work i came i come out of a call a little bit a little bit <laughs> a little bit a little bit jittery, like i'm i like i'm controlling myself to stay with my client and not get let my excitement take over um it's uh what's so fulfilling about that work what's like you said you said juicy you said fulfilling like what is it that you that really resonates with you or that you're finding to uh yeah that you're finding lights you up or maybe what's different about it It, it goes to a deeper values place. People come out of it with a focus that's based more on, on discovering things about themselves. It's, it's less, 
It's less the tactical, how do I be more assertive in this meeting by changing my vocabulary with three different words? You know, I mean, I, I've taught those workshops. So I'm happy to go back to them and deliver them again. Mm -hmm. um, here's your three ways to be more assertive tomorrow. Um, but th those tend to be very surface. Mm -hmm. And that kind of coaching, the EQ or 360 or one-on-one -on -one for six months, three times a week getting together you you're going to deeper places and i like that i appreciate that i, I can <laughs> i consider it a real privilege to help someone discover and then shift where they're gonna focus their the the, the energy that is their life i mean that's amazing it's an amazing privilege <laughs> yeah that's uh that transformative work you know that's my background's in addiction and mental health and so spending time around the campfire with young people talking through their addiction and seeing the behavior like tangible behavior changes but deep deep transformation as opposed to that transactional nature sometimes of those mm -hmm. short sharp like come in for a day and do communication skills 101 like i i feel you on that it's like there's usefulness there but it's the depth maybe isn't there and the true kind of transformative power of that intervention or you're like because you're spending your life energy too right so it's not just yeah. take them harness their own and direct it more more purposefully um yeah. and you take things actional um which is really cool it was it came up with a, a coach i i have in my community a couple weeks back uh, her name's sherry she and i were talking about how some some clients that are in the same industry she has a client in in automotive i have a couple clients in automotive and, and we were talking about how our two clients are both just thinking really transactional. And, and we, here we are as coaches trying to help them see and think in a, in a systemic way instead of a transactional way. And, and I gotta be careful, you know, I don't wanna <laughs> drop my, my thinking style down on top of my client, that's, that's, bad form but to be able to pull back and see more of the system of your life instead of the transactions it's it's a different way to look mm -hmm. yeah for sure you mentioned um you mentioned a model or a tool or you know the the 360s that you've been doing around emotional mm -hmm. intelligence um i would love to spend a little bit of time um digging into eq because i know that that's something you've been doing a lot of and i've done a little bit of it so, you know it's on the i'm familiar with it but i'd love to dig into that particular topic um and especially for viewers or listeners people who are listening to this after the fact um like what is eq and why is it important um first though i'm going to whenever i get a comment from a viewer i'd love to throw it up on the screen yeah, and this is somebody that we know well uh, mr vince fowler talking about tedx canmore being the birthplace of some pretty epic relationships and there's a lot of truth in that statement it was actually i'd call it a turning point in my professional career with the relationships and the, the friendships that came out of that. So um, thanks for watching, Vince. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, if anybody else has questions or comments or things they want to ask Evan or I um, throughout the night, if you're tuning in live, then by all means, just throw it in the comments. And we'll, uh, we'll throw them up. But before, in the meantime, let's talk about EQ. Let's talk mm -hmm. about what it is, maybe high level, kind of what it is and why it might be important for a leader or for anybody to like understand emotional intelligence. No, not a small question. <laughs> it's like three huge questions side by each. Uh, what it is, it's, it, I think of EQ like a prism. To me, EQ is, is, is all of these stimulus come in and, and how do I emotionally process all of this energy that's coming in? And then, and then, oh, by the way, it's going to go out of me and it's going to spread into all these different places. And how's it going out of me? And EQ is me figuring out the emotional prism that I am. All this energy comes in and I process it and, 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 and it keeps going. And, and what am I casting on the world beside me as this energy comes through as an emotion? Uh, and I got to be aware of it. And, and I got to figure out how it affects my relationships and how it affects my decision making and how it affects my, my stress management. 
and how and 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 frankly even just how i how i carry it around and and how it affects my own self regard because all of those matter all of those are, are inevitable elements of emotion moving through me Short version so yeah no, and that's great i love that metaphor actually of, of a prism i haven't heard that before and i like that visual and i like the yeah i, I think it's a great metaphor and I guess the follow-up question, maybe I'll, I'll try and break my questions up a little bit more. I have a tendency to ask multiple questions at the same time, working on it. Yeah. Um, how do you help people? Well, I guess what's the first step in the emotional intelligence journey for somebody who's like, yeah, I think I need to like get more attuned to my emotional regulation awareness state. Like, how do you go about, because you uh, obviously it's a piece of your coaching practice. Mm -hmm. It's probably a, a, a topic you spend a lot of time on how do you introduce people to it and what are if are there steps in people getting more attuned to their emotions and how that how it shows up for them well three times out of four it's a client who asks me about using or doing or working on emotional intelligence they're the ones who bring it up first uh, that said classic early stage coaching what what's what's is really thorough goal setting what what's the reason to work on emotional intelligence what's the value you're going to get out of that what's the challenge you're having with that um, assuming we go and do a self-assessment how does that change help you because a tool is only as good as your intention for the tool and and we could go and use a mental toughness quotient mt48 mental toughness quotient 48 questions uh, we could go and use an insights um, it has more to do with what you want to get out of it at the back end begin with the end in mind then then why you want to use that tool that said i'm a fan of emotional intelligence for a couple reasons uh, the two biggest being that that it is very thorough like it's a level b psychometric and for anyone who doesn't know what that means it, <laughs> it it's not a chatelaine quiz like it's not, you don't not care one of those 10 questions to see what disney character you are not no one of those. no this is questions that test against other questions to make sure you're answering both questions consistently and then tells people that there's k factors for lying there's there there there's factor analysis of things that we pull out and say well these three come together and that has nothing to do with the way you answered it but they do come out that way like it's really quite thick and thorough um in a way that most personality inventories don't get to um and and the second reason i like it is that it is very much an inventory i'm a fan of that term relative to these kinds of tools i don't like calling them tests because that implies pass fail uh inventory what's your skill set level at now? And it's going to change, right? You're going to get more inventory and you're going to get less inventory and this is going to grow or shrink. And, and so it works very much like an inventory. At the end of working on this for nine months, six months, four months, uh, you should expect, if you want to do it again, to get different levels. Um, because you worked on your assertiveness, you built your self-regulation, you improved your optimism, you you radically altered how emotions are affecting your decision making. For example, yeah, and there's interesting. And I haven't looked at the research for probably a while, a couple of years, but there's some pretty strong correlations between emotional intelligence and performance, right? And in all areas of life, you know, relationship performance, but leadership performance, um, you know, it's as or more important than IQ, especially I think the higher, I think the research was the higher you get up in an organization, mm -hmm. like the less of an individual contributor you are. And like, mm -hmm. you, the less you need to be smart in a narrow kind of domain, which is most, mm -hmm. you know, and you get into like, c-suite jobs where you actually have to just lead people and mm -hmm. you know intelligence becomes the primary factor in success in those environments yeah. and and an emotion is going to pull you 
you know, left or right, depending on the situation you're in. And there's some really cool research to show that um, one of the most crucial leadership skills a person can have is, is how well they facilitate the performance of others. And that skill doesn't grow very well on its own. It, it genuinely needs to be taught, mentored, cultivated, coached, and emotional intelligence is one of the entry points. You know, if you want to stick a lever in that facilitate others muscle, emotional intelligence is one of the one of the ways you can speed up that ability. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the reasons I like it. Yeah, that social regulation function, right? Of like self regulation is important, but then the ability to regulate the emotions and moods of other people in a room like that's a that's a master leadership skill right and i didn't realize how lucky i was to work with youth drug addicts in the wilderness for 10 years but it's like that ability to see the distress and respond to it and like just that practice those reps that i got in doing that means you know i kind of laughed the first time i walked into a boardroom full of executives because it was like oh you guys are easy like this is easy compared to a room full of yeah. teenagers yeah. Like yelling and like punching walls this is right great. Yeah. Yeah. I get like, I guess what, what would somebody do? So you do an assessment, you do an emotional and like um, an EQ test of some kind and somebody scores a certain, whatever they've got this inventory and they mm -hmm. want to, they want to grow that they want to mm -hmm. improve on a skill or they want to like turn the dial on one of those domains. What's, what's the next step for somebody? Like, what do you, and I realize this is like getting into the nitty gritties um, of coaching a little bit, but yeah, I know that's cool. Short version is is getting into with an individual where that shows up for you in real life, and and for example, and and throw to a couple minutes ago, we were talking about about system, right, of how people live and behave, as opposed to being transactional. If you go to a half day workshop on assertiveness, all you learn is about how to speak assertively as opposed to um, how do I behave? How do I act? How do I interact? How do I absorb? How do I, how, how do I project assertively? Oh, by the way, that's going to balance against my flexibility and stress tolerance. And we'll use me as the example. Once upon a time, I had really high flexibility and really high stress tolerance and really low uh, assertiveness. And I'm using some of the EQ terms that are classic, but that most people get on purpose. And this is a very real experience to me and I'm sure you can appreciate how would people around me treat me if I put up with everything and I'm really good about it and I don't complain and oh, by the way, I don't speak up for myself either. Uh, there, there was a lot of dumping on Evan going on, to be perfectly blunt. And, and, and so that's the kind of thing to answer your question. You've done this EQ assessment and seen some of these imbalances or strengths, uh, these inventory levels. Um, so how are these showing up in real life for you? What's going on? How, how do you explain that? Oh, I get dumped on. I need to find more balance my confidence in these scenarios my, and 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 people <laughs> people are smart you know especially when it comes to seeing their lives play out it's the beauty of coaching step back for an hour multiple times together and look at your life and go yeah that pattern is happening and so once you start to see how that pattern is happening in real life, then you get to decide, okay, are we gonna are we gonna change how I look at it, which would in turn alter the behavior, or do we change the behavior and then that in turn trickles back to how I look at it? And that that's getting a little heady, but real in life a, does it play out in real life. Yeah, in a nutshell, it's not just awareness for awareness sake, it's taking that awareness. And then looking at life and saying, is this, is this aligned? Is there alignment here between how you want to be perceived, how you want to act, how you want to be valued or, you know, and how like things are actually a little bit of reality therapy is what we would call mm -hmm. that. 
Right? Sure. How's that? How's this work for you? How's this like not setting boundaries helpful? And and <laughs> and to your question thirty minutes ago, is this even a place we need to work? Because now that we've spent thirteen minutes figuring out that this thing that there that there's a hole here. Are we going to spend the next three weeks filling in a pothole that isn't even in the road? Well, no. And and if it's not your priority and it's not your area of focus and it's not the direction your life is going, then we don't need to work on that. Yeah. I'm, I'm super curious before we move on to topic, the next topic, whichever one that's going to be uh, to be determined. Um, what was the turning point for you to go from high flexibility, um, Evan, who's getting dumped on to Evan with some boundaries or Evan who doesn't get dumped on? Was there a turning point and, or what was the process like for you, um, to shift that? And was it a coach or a mentor that helped with that? Was that a self-driven project? What was the impetus behind that shift in your own life? Uh, it was absolutely, we'll say a coach at the time I called her a mentor. Um, but looking back, the process was very much a coaching process. Those get you know, mixed up. So it was a, it was a woman I worked with uh, very closely, Barb, who was capable of seeing and talking me through the, the strength I did have in assertiveness, because you have some that was being really good at controlling me. And um, in, in particular, I was really good at, at what I will call won't power. Historically, for whatever reason, I mean, it'll be a long dig back. I, I've been good at won't power. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. I won't eat that. I won't drink that. I won't go there. I won't spend my time on this. And, and you want to go smoke? No, I won't. Um, and helping me figure out how to use that in an interpersonal, interdisciplinary, at work way to say respectfully, I won't put up with this. Mm -hmm. That's the short version. Awesome. Well, thank you for that because it's uh, I'm always curious around the those those, those turning point moments. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I imagine that that can probably be traced back. That that shift for you in awareness can pro probably set you on a trajectory. Um, that's yeah. like that thread can probably be traced all right to today, right? In some in some level, those yeah. those, those power. That's the the transformative nature of coaching and mentoring therapy, like the, that suite of practice where we're really digging into our own tendencies and preferences and histories and how we show up in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we've, we started off this conversation with kind of focus and distraction. Those mm -hmm. kind of two sides of the coin. Um, what else is a common thing that shows up in coaching when you're coaching clients? Um, is that kind of like, I imagine you've got a kind of a breadth of things that people would seek coaching for, um, from like communication skills to interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. to like, what are some of those other things you find yourself talking about a lot? And maybe we can dig into one of those um, tonight as well. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so what, one of my favorite coaching questions, and, and you know, coaches shouldn't have favorite questions because you're going to use it too much and that's a bias, whatever. Coaches have favorite questions. Uh, one of my favorites is is to ask a client, especially if I'm feeling a little unsure where where they want to go, um, what role they want me to be in. What are, you, what are you looking for from me today? And a client will say straight up, "Well, I, I need a bullshit detector today, or I need you to help me find the holes in this thinking, or." Um, I know there's a blind spot. I just don't know where it is because it's a blind spot. Um, and, and, and those are, those are three that show up quite often for me. Um, um, blind spot, bullshit detector, find holes in my thinking. Um, 
help me get to action even though I've been around this block three times and I still haven't done anything with this idea? Those are some of the big ones. Uh, now, to be fair, six years ago, a woman that I that I had as my coach when I was taking some some grad school again, she said to me, her name's Bonice. Bonice, hey, Bonice, if you're out there. Um, she said to me, oh, so you coach people who are under a lot of pressure and want to stay focused. Yeah, I do. Ultra endurance athletes, speakers, owners and senior leaders of middle sized companies who are going through change, who have new responsibilities. Yeah, it's people who are under a lot of pressure and they don't want to screw it up. So they're either holding on too tight or whatever. So but actually that might be a great departure point for the, the rest of our conversation around pressure because like I would say COVID and what I've noticed, like interestingly what happened in the, in the spring is like basically all of my workshops have shifted into wellness, resiliency building, self-care, mm -hmm. whole strategies like that realm because the pressure, the, you know, call it all static stress load has just like at through the roof, right? Like all of us are feeling, you know, I'm gaining weight. I know some other folks that are friends that are like, we're gaining a little bit of weight. We're drinking a little more al alcohol. And it's like I'm pretty high functioning most of the time, like pretty disciplined most of the time. And this extra layer of stress mm -hmm. is like, I, I, so I know that all my clients are feeling it. And like all of us are feeling it. Right. And so the pressure kind of regardless of the, I guess the normal pressure or pressure that we might experience is like, I think all of us are feeling that stress and pressure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what are some of the, and without getting into like trite advice, because that's like the self-care advice always gets super trite, right? It's like, well, you should just go to bed and not binge drink watch Netflix, and drink more water and go for long walks. It's like, yeah, it's not actually that helpful. Thanks for, um, thanks for that advice. But that said, like it is super helpful and that's the stuff that we need to be doing. But there's a, there's a, there's an intermediary place there, I think, between Right. recognizing the stress and the pressure and actually taking action. And that sounds like the work that you spend some time in with I people. Know. Yeah. How do you execute? How do you go from awareness to execution? Well, and, 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 and it's worth the two or three minutes for anyone with any, for, for any client with anyone they're working with to at least cover the base that is, are you, are you doing the basics? Are you drinking so much that you pee clear? Are you sleeping seven nights, seven hours a night? Are you moving? A lot. Um, do you have a healthy escape? Not a numb out escape, but a healthy one. Whatever that is. I, I, I can remember working with athletes to try and help them tune up their focus on lap three of their race, except that they didn't sleep the night before. It doesn't matter what intervention I have or what cool technique you practice. If you're not sleeping, you're, you're hooked, right? Um, that said, there are a few things that I'm a fan of doing. And, and I think what you're asking is what, what, what could people do to handle pressure? Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. Or what can people do to see, to bridge that gap or that that space between, I know I'm under lots of pressure. I can feel the stress that's accumulating in my life. It's starting to leak out. I need to take action, but there's a, there's a gap or there's a, there's obstacles obviously between that awareness that we need to take action and actually taking action on that yeah. stress or responding to that pressure in, yeah. in, a, in a healthy way. Yeah. Well, I, I genuinely believe that people need time detached from whatever is causing the pressure, even even if it's just, you know, the 60 minutes once a week with your helping professional where they get to just, just put it all down. Uh, I, was, I was blessed as a young man, even though there was huge and, and, and bizarre pressure in the form of crap that was going on in my family to be able to go to a, in Ontario, a cabin on an island in the middle of BF nowhere, like nothing out there. 
and completely remove myself from that pressure so that you could look at it and 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 get it in perspective and i know people use that word a lot but um but to me get it in perspective means means a few things not the least of which are how big is this really and and in the world of covid i consider myself blessed that i spent years managing risk and i know you talked to to ken wiley a couple of weeks back um and and most of North America doesn't think about risk 18 times a day before COVID. But the people who did, they got a leg up. They know how, they know how to think about this, right? Um, and, and, and so having the perspective of how big is this problem really? And I don't mean the whole thing. I mean, right now in this moment, you're leaving the grocery store and your mask slipped or you forgot hand sand. How big is this problem really? How do I handle it really? Not what am I afraid of, but what's available to me to do? Because fear pulls us to focus on things that aren't doable, pulls us to focus on the threat. And, and that's a, just a bizarre psychological thing that goes on. Um, and there's a question too, going a step sideways of, of, uh, the funky term is attentional attribution. And, and that was a popular term 20 years ago when I was in school, but now we use the term bandwidth. And if, and if my bandwidth is 10 units wide and, and six of them are being taken up by the dog is sick and my kids homeschooling and my wife wants to chat with me about this and we don't have all the Christmas gifts left, bought, well, uh, then I've only got four units left <laughs> to deal with what's happening today. No wonder I'm feeling under pressure. I'm only using four of my 10 units. So sometimes the exercise is, is one of completion, one of how do I put down some of the weight? Because I, I don't have to carry that all day, every day. Um, and, and there, and then I get back a few units and now I'm working with seven or eight and can I focus better when I'm working with seven or eight attention units? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can. Which brings us back a little bit full circle to how we started. It sounds like your morning practice is a perspective setting. Like it's a little bit of detachment and perspective, like on a daily kind of a daily basis. It's interesting because you know, my experience in wilderness therapy, I, I always go back to that, that experience of working with kids in, in the woods, because just the, just the physical relocation of them into the woods and away from mm -hmm. school and peers and family, like that, that space. And maybe that's the thing like that you're really talking about is spaciousness, right? That cabin for you growing up, you know, in Ontario and probably your own cabin now with your kids, like it's, it's space and time that can be used to perspective set. Totally. Right? And to reconnect to what's most meaningful or what's most important to us. And that's, and like you say, if you have 10, 10 units and COVID is taking up eight of them, right. And the news and insert whatever else, it's, it's pretty hard to see how, how we can cope with stress and mm -hmm. to like deal with the pressure that that, yeah. that might generate that extra layer. Sure. I mean, people talk about this. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, social network. Uh, on Netflix, I, a couple of friends of mine have mentioned it and how, oh, I discovered I got to do this and I got to do this, I got to do this. And everything they're talking about is removing distractions so that they get attention units back so that they can do their own life instead of what the world is picking at them. Well, no kidding. I mean, yeah, you need to have your attention for you. And, and, and it isn't easy. Our parents had it easier. I genuinely believe that. No offense, Dad. Um, but when they went to the grocery store, they didn't have to stop and think about which meat to buy, GMO, non-GMO, organic, non-organic, does all natural mean organic. There was only organic meat. There was only one option. They didn't have to give any attention to that because if you bought a steak, it was organic. 
Yeah, and the amount of would have me. Yeah, the amount of noise that we have to sift through on a on a moment to moment, day to day basis is incredible. When you actually step back from it, it's it's amazing that we can get anything done half the time. When when I look at all the inputs or all the possible inputs in uh, in my own life, yeah. and so then as managers or parents, managers of kids, we got to set up these boundaries and we've got to, to, to hold at bay these distractions, not only for ourselves, but for other people. <sighs> you wonder why you're exhausted. I mean, you're lifting more weight than you ever had to for multiple other people. And just because it's, it's um, two pounds, 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 doesn't mean it doesn't add up to 35 or 45 or 55. And there's this weird thing that will happen whereby if, if I'm only working on one thing and there's then one distraction, I notice it. But if I'm carrying around eight things and there's one distraction, I don't notice that that distraction happened. It's a, it's a relativity thing. Um, the physical example would be if I'm carrying five pounds and you add five, I notice. If I'm carrying 50 and you add five, I don't notice. So as individuals, if we want to be more careful about what we're doing, we the, the benefit of it compounds until we're down to, okay, this is the one thing I'm working on. This is the one place I'm putting my mind, my energy. And along comes the dog who wants to pee. And I'm going to notice that that's a distraction. Along comes the buzzing phone. I'm going to notice that. Along comes the idea about my dad and I haven't got him a Christmas gift yet. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and we keep using outside examples. I apologize for that. Everyone who's listening because I know that what was the number of the last piece of research I read? Like eight out of 10 distractions are coming from the inside. They're not coming from out there. They're your own automatic interrupting thoughts. That's the funky term for them um, that crop up and want to take you sideways. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that when you talk about the observer and that ability that that person or that piece of you that can sit outside of your ruminations and those interrupting thoughts and I say, hey, Westlake, time to focus. This isn't what your priority is. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating. Do, does, do they always talk to you? Is it like, is it your last name? Do they use your last name? Voice your hand no, but everybody wants to know how to say it. So that's, I just, I don't know. Years ago, I defaulted to say my own last name so people would know how to pronounce it. <laughs> that, that ability, that skill to be an observer of our life as opposed to just be stuck in it, in the throes of it, moment to moment, day to day. Like you say, like we'll have eight things going all of a sudden and we won't notice that we've checked Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, but we haven't written that important email to that client or bought the Christmas present for the kid or like it just, it's when everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, right? And we don't mm -hmm. get anything done and then we get stuck and then we get stuck and we get stressed out and then we develop coping strategies to deal with the stress. Like it's this, it's this funny chain reaction of, of events. Yeah. And, and hopefully the observer figures out, as mine did back in April, leaving the kitchen after doing the dishes. If I turn right out of the kitchen, I go to the dining table and I play Shadow of Mordor, which is a distraction and a waste. If I turn left out of the kitchen, I go to the couch and watch and sit mind quietly beside my son who's playing among us with the cousins. And it would be easy to say, well, they're both video games and you're basically just sitting your dinner. Except, but, but no, one of them is, is just way better quality time. And in the moment, video game versus video game, I'm not gonna make a good decision, but turn on my observer and see, sitting beside your 10 year old who's talking to the cousins while playing a game that requires some genuine interactive thinking and strategy, and he's gonna talk to you about it too. That's just higher value where I wanna be. 
went to, at some road and we probably won't have time to dig into it tonight because I'm not going to keep you all night and to dig into values, but knowing what your values are makes, gives that observer a bit of a filter to look at your behavior through and see, is this, is this congruent or incongruent with like how I want to be present in my own life or how I want to spend my time? Because there, yeah. there has to be value there for you for family time or engagement with your son. There absolutely. Is. That to make more sense than in certain a thousand other activities. And, and I don't want to shortcut that. Um, a lot of people I have noticed when I ask them about values or talk to them about values, there's this kind of like, oh, you want me to eat the elephant? Oh, shit. Um, so over the last few years, I've developed a slightly different tact that is to talk to people about roles. And, uh, and sometimes I'll do the long version that is, you know, list off all 15, 18, 25 roles you're in. But ultimately it is to get around to what are the three, four, five roles that you want to be extraordinary in. And then... What are the goals for the roles? And then what are the activities that fit with the intentions that fit with those roles? And Shadow of Mordor doesn't fit with any role that I wanna be in, but sitting on the couch with my son does fit with the role I wanna be in. I love that. And we've, we've had that conversation, I think, before. I, roles, roles and goals. It's a nice way to get some of that altitude in the same way that talking about values yeah. and strengths and needs and like some of those other more abstract things yeah. that you say like, you know, a little bit like eating an elephant, but that like, what is a, what is that father role? And what is that, what does being an extraordinary one look like? Yeah. Uh, it gives you tangible actions and gives you that filter to look at these options. And this one makes the most sense. Yeah. And what's coach role and what's co-star. My wife and I call each other co-stars role and what's, you know, and even, and even to give myself, yourself, anyone to give yourself permission to be ordinary in a role that isn't one of your top five. Because yard work is not one of them, like do it yourself in house care. I'm okay being ordinary in that role. I have an ordinary lawn. I have an ordinary living room. I have ordinary decor and I'm totally fine with it because it's not one of my top five. Mm -hmm. Not, not important. Um, you know, focus there. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, we got another comment from Vince. He's our fan. He's our super fan tonight. So I'm going <laughs> to throw it up here just so we can uh, give him a little bit of air time. But uh Clarity in his values and recognizing what those values look like in action has been exceptionally helpful uh, decision-making criteria. And essentially that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Roles, values, however we want to look and frame them, it's decision-making criteria, right? It's a way for us to be intentional about mm -hmm. our choices and what we're choosing to focus on because, and I think what we're realizing more and more, at least what I'm realizing more and more is like the attentional, those attentional resources, like those are real. Right. And when we talk about like your time and energy, we're actually talking about attention, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about our ability to allocate and focus that point, that attention, that time and energy at something. And mm -hmm. like we are living in a day and age that is all about, it's an attention market, right? Like our attention is being hacked as we speak, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of demand to get our attention and to distract us, to pull us away from what's important. So I actually think that like, this is a critical conversation. Um, and I imagine a critical one that you have with your clients to bring to them a sense of clarity and focus on uh, on what's important. Yeah. Where do you put your best attention? It is. It absolutely is. Because, you, I mean, at the risk of sounding Yoda, your world is what you pay attention to. And, and if you're letting someone else choose what you pay attention to, then, then someone else is literally choosing your world for you. And I, I <laughs> uh, throw back to Barb, that mentor I mentioned, uh, she would say, Evan, you're giving the power away. Yeah. Which when we think about this show and the, the topic, that's a great <laughs> way to wrap this up. Evan, yeah. That was very nice. 
like where is our power and like most fundamentally from our like a personal powers perspective it's the ability to choose right it's the ability to affect change it's the ability to focus and give our attention to something yeah. like that that is powerful um yeah. i think that that note so um we should probably wrap up there because that'll be the most insightful thing that i'm able to come up with at this time <laughs> of night um, but before we go what's something that's had an impact on you from like a book or a podcast or um an mm. author like some kind of resource some people can i always like to give kind of one or two takeaways like go go read this because i found it interesting or you know a favorite podcast whatever comes to mind from a resource perspective um, Current, currently, I'm a big fan of the NPR, How I Built This. Guy Raz, such a good show. Yeah. Um, and, and at the beginning of COVID, he did a, he did a, a long segment on uh, resilience. And he went back and talked to people who, who he had interviewed before and how they were handling COVID. And, and some of those resilience episodes that were happening in April and May, really, really cool business-based, um, how you stay focused, how, you, how are you making choices about this, how you be an intentional. Um, um, to, be, <laughs> to be a little more esoteric and throw back to, uh, you know, formative Evan. In my late teens, someone put in my hands the book, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, a guy named Dan Millman wrote it. I think I've reread that book about eight times. I want my kids to read it, praying they get even a sliver of what I got out of it. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, those are two great recommendations. And I actually, I listened to, I think it was Guy Raz being interviewed by Tim Ferriss. Maybe mm -hmm. it might've been a Tim Ferriss episode, but it was like, it was a reverse. It was like him being interviewed instead of doing mm -hmm. interviewing. Super mm -hmm. fascinating. Great episode. So I will find it and I will send it your way and I'll put it in the show notes for people as well as some links back to uh, last quick note. And I don't I have the wrong flip chart behind me, but I just did a video for some of my clients based on uh, Kelly McGonigal. If you know that name, uh, M C G O N I C A L McGonigal. Uh, she wrote a book called the willpower instinct and she breaks down self-discipline into three separate powers. Uh, so it's a really neat, really neat book. Awesome. Well, those are great. And those will keep me busy for sure. I'm going to go, uh, go grab a copy or two of those books. So Evan, uh, it's a pleasure as always to speak with you. And again, thank you so much for taking time out of your Monday night to, to chat with me and to uh, have a good, good old conversation about focus and, uh, and everything else that's related to this navigating these times that we're in, um, both as a parent and uh, as a, as a fellow coach and consultant, it's uh, always nice to, to pick your brain and to hear your insights. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's fun. Wonderful. And thank you, Vince. You are a great, uh, you are a two time. I'll have to have you on again, Evan, because Vince has been on twice. And so I can't play favorites for the show. But uh, thank you, Vince, for tuning in. We appreciate it and uh, appreciate you. And so thank you very much. And uh, everyone have a wonderful evening.